Yes, it gives me great pleasure now to announce our next speaker. I've not actually heard Robert speak before, so it's going to be a real treat for me for the first time. But I know just from reading his CV, uh, he's, he's got so much that he's done with his life. Stuff that is absolutely in tune with uh, everything I'm passionate about. And hey, anyone who plays saxophone for the Beach Boys, just gets my vote my <laughs> back. That's uh, so pleased to have you here, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Beach Boy thing, you know, I played for three years in 1975 through 1979. And I'm still smoking that. I'm telling you, man. The, the fact that I played with the Beach Boys, it overshadows anything else I've ever done in my life. I love that. Because everybody's here with good vibrations, right? <laughs> All right. But actually, there is something very interesting about that time I had with Brian Wilson. So, in 1977, I had the, the pleasure of uh, being in a recording session with Brian Wilson alone. Brian Wilson is the main genius of the Beach Boys. And he, you know, get into some state of consciousness. And it was quite remarkable. You guys have all seen the movie Amadeus. So Mozart would literally see everything, download everything all at once which is not how I used to compose. It was like, you know, you know it can't be that way. It's got to be changed this way, got together. So Brian Wilson was very much the same. He had a lot of mental problems and so forth. So I don't know, there's all kinds of theories about what he was going through. But I was sitting next to him, and he sat down at the piano, and he started doodling away at the piano, you know. You know, he's kind of fidgeting. And then he stops for like, 20 seconds, which is a long time. And then he plays this song. Everything is perfect. And not only is he playing the song on the piano, he's singing all the different parts. Not only is he singing all the different parts, if Michael's going to sing this, da da da. Al Jardine's going to sing this, da da da. Everything perfectly, all at once. And then Robert, you're going to play this on the saxophone. No, no, no. Not like that. I'm to play it again, you know, right? And he had it all completely perfect. And then he got fidgety and, you know, he wanted to get a cigarette and he left. And we have another hit song. You know, this is almost as good as good vibrations. The next morning, Brian, let's, let's finish that song, you know, with, with the other guys. It was one song. So, seriously, the. It's sad that he had this mental problem or a mental condition, but on the other side of this was his ability to transcend his own mind, to transcend his own condition, and tap into something extraordinary. And that extraordinary feel that he tapped into was, was something that I believe, and I know for certain these days, that we can all tap into. And we get there in different ways. So one of the themes that I'll be talking about today is, is life and death. And you know, these are these are delicate subjects to bring up. All of us have experienced someone who has passed on and the grief and the colega. You know, we all had to endure for whatever reason, sometimes child, some, you know, there's there's odd things that are happening around this concept of, of death and, and rebirth in life. The reason why I wanted to talk about it was in 1979, during my time with the Beach Boys, I got very, very, very sick, very ill, and the doctors didn't know what was going on. And so uh, there was one point I was down to 110 pounds. You know, I wasn't digesting. My liver was long, not doing the right thing. And this and that wasn't correct. And the doctor said, "You know, Robert, 
we've been seeing you for almost two years and you don't get into the hospital, or if you don't, if we don't figure out what's wrong with you, you're going to be dead in six months. And uh, they said, go to the hospital, by the way, and I'm thinking, you know, I think if I want to live, I should stay out of the hospital. <laughs> but uh, it, was an, it was an intuition, but it was also my own common sense. They had no idea what was wrong. Why would they all of a sudden figure it out if I'm in the hospital bed? But what I did instead was I was, I was young and didn't have too many attachments. And um, I was very spiritual, so I just began to pray and meditate. Pray and meditate every day. And if there is, if there is something that I can do to continue my incarnation or heal up or you know whatever, that I, I need I need some information about that because I had no idea. I just kept getting sicker and sicker. And there was a couple of moments where I would pass out and get up and wander around and you know I stop playing my saxophone and doing other things at that point, but I was still living in beautiful Santa Barbara. So one morning I I fell down and there I was looking at my body. And I had not heard of a near-death experiences. I had not heard of that concept. But I had done some out-of-body things and I, you know, studied spirituality and had some experiences that were metaphysical. But I remember looking at my body and then actually thinking, well, what is the perceiver here? And I began to not really care about that, but I later returned to that place and started to figure that out. But, uh, so I turned and there was only light. I didn't see any relatives that had passed on, I didn't see any of that, like I later read in books. I just, there was only light. There was only light. There wasn't me in the light. So in a sense, we all had the same experience because there was no separation. Somehow, I had been catapulted into a domain of complete unity. And I couldn't, but there wasn't a subject-object relationship to that unity. It was only afterwards that I became a dual citizen of the universe with a subject and an object and a process of perception. But at the first place, there was only a form, there was only a consciousness aware of light. And you can imagine the, the, this light, um, we call it light, I call it light. Of course, it's, it's not like the sunlight or the light bulbs. Um, it was a fulfillment. It was fulfillment. It was freedom. It was unity. It was complete love. And from that place, I was cast out, you could say, I separated from it. And of course, there was like gravity, you know, one little vacuum, and kind of unified with the light. And there was a master then that showed up, said I had a choice. And um, I said, well, do I have a purpose to go back? And the answer was yes. And that started a series of perceptions. And one of the, so I, in a sense, started to precipitate back down into my physical body. And uh, I saw a bunch of things. And one of the domains is full of symbols. And one of the domains is full of sounds. And one of the domains is full of all you kinds know, of geometries and mathematics. Other domains, I'm not doing these in order, by the way. There's, there's angelic beings. And by the way, I, I shared the story with a couple uh, people besides uh, you all. and. Uh, there are some scientists who say, well, it's all in your brain, it's all in your brain, or, you know, it's all something that doesn't really matter to me. If, if, 
there was something in my brain core that, that had that kind of experience, then, and then the, the whole clairvoyant thing followed. So what about clairvoyance? Well, when you get three or four people who are also clairvoyant, and we're all saying the same thing, and do a double blind test, then I'll bring all of our brain cores. So it's very interesting, but I saw some things that um, later became relevant in my life. But this is, this is probably the, the coolest thing, because I remember now I'm in my body, there's these uh, gaps. So I was in a dimension and there's like a little blackout. Uh, I see me I'm waking up in this other dimension and waking up. So the final gap before my physical body, and then you know, laying down there, and then rushed into the hospital and stuff. I'm making the story short and the heart wasn't going. But now I'm, you know, I'm in my body and still in Santa Barbara, kind of wiggling my toes. And I remember hearing the insects and the birds and the ocean sounds. It was the first thing I remember hearing in this nervous system. And there was such an intelligence and such beauty and such uh, Dr. Leslow talks about information fields. And the intelligence that nature owns and is, is not only holding information for a reconciliation of a certain phase of humanity that's included suffering and cruelty but it includes a blueprint for a state of existence without cruelty and suffering. Um, and I remember hearing these like, little insects, and then I realized that the same intelligence as nature, that was nature, was also the intelligence that started in my heart beating again, and my breath. And and so there wasn't any, there wasn't any difference. The intelligence of nature weren't, you know, thinking about well, we're our lives, you know, we're all from the earth. We, we are all in a holistic relationship with nature itself. And Dr. Laszlo and most of you have said something that we can't heal somebody else, we heal ourselves. I, I understand that because I picked myself up, and the doctors came and all that stuff, and um, I exited the, the hospital ER thing and, and started walking around and living and started to heal up. And I realized that I had tapped into something that not only healed my body, but it was full of information, it was full of symbology and full of hints. So um, I'm going to play a little video. Okay. I, I still am more, mostly a right brain guy. So I, I used to do films or do soundtracks and stuff. So I sat with the filmmaker a while back and, and I said I started talking about everything. You know, I said we gotta get like a three-minute film that has everything. So if you watch carefully you see it all here. It's like the evolution of humanity.
So there was, towards the beginning, after the galaxies, we recognized that part of humanity that includes suffering and pain. Uh, so I began to wonder if, if that was always going to be the case. And the answer that I got was no. <laughs> so let me show you some things here. Information fields. So let's say we're in a recording studio. Simon can read. This is probably most of us. So she's singing away. She's causing sound vibrations. There's all kinds of things happening here. It's going into a microphone, right? So then the information changes states from an acoustic vibratory singing woman to, let's just say, electronic signals. And then over here, in this case, it goes the old organization of radios. It goes to your antenna. Another phase. So right here, let's say we're the two in here. We wouldn't, we wouldn't hear her singing, would we? But the information would be there. Or if we looked at the electrons passing through these wires and the amplifier, the audio engineering equipment, we, we couldn't really hear her at this phase either. So, so we need a receiver that tunes into the right frequency that receives the information, and then these two guys can hear her. Right. So I like this analogy, it's not an analogy, it's the reality of uh, information fields that are changing their state, changing their uh, perceived um, informational quality for a human being. And of course, we can go, what, what motivated her to sing, her nervous system, well, of course, her, her childhood, you know, she heard grandpa sing and inspired her, and on her like that, out with these guys, then go over the feet. So this is a continuum that really doesn't have a, uh, a definite beginning. So let's say this is our soul. And our soul is giving us information for our health, for our lives, for the more holistic potential of our reality. And our, our soul, or the blueprint of our higher potential, as nature, part of nature, specific for one little plant or one little bird, one little cell in the bird, one human being. Our soul is communicating this. And there's electromagnetic interference or stress or something. Then our ability to live our lives according to our highest potential is compromised, right? Now, the interesting thing is that most of the patterns of interference are not because we're bad people. It's because, and this was fascinating, it's because of the cycles of time. So after I, I'm going to jump a little bit, after I had this new death experience, I, I began to pray for more information. And what I learned to do, you could say, was go through the death portal. There are portals that connect us to other dimensions all the time. And when Brian Wilson connected to that place, he didn't have to go through the death portal. He had to a little bit. Maybe the death of his ego, maybe the death of his mind, you can say it that way. You know? He was able to then channel information that wasn't available to him in a mind emotional restriction. So uh, I was saying a certain prayer and I learned certain things about subtle bodies and protection and so forth. Very, very important. And, and, and I would go through the death portal and my body would cease for a little bit, not as long as it did maybe 10 or 20 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. And going to the depth of the world, I would go to these dimensions that were always a higher potential. Always a higher potential. 
of information. So the reason I say that is that along the way there are symbols that we see in our subconscious, or we see in our dreams, or we see in our um, epiphanies, and we also see symbols in nature, sacred geometry, there's all kinds of hints about information fields. So, all right, so musicians know that this is a symbol for treble clef, right? Bass clef. And so, oh, let me back up. So, if, if you had no idea what this was, you look at this symbol and you just, you know, you've never seen music before. You just, it's some, some kind of pattern, it looks kind of different. But you wouldn't think it was anything. It could be a, a tree. But now, most people know music. Okay, we all get this is music. You say music, right? The mind, we might like learn this. And then these are symbols for certain notes. Now, Brian Wilson had perfect pitch. So, when, when he sang, it was up to others to write stuff down. You know? And he'd write too, but not so well. And, and, and then we go back and we, we remember what he sang or the song he wanted us to play because of the symbols. The symbols are reminding us of information. Now, on the higher, you could say on these different planes, there's other kinds of symbols. The modulus and there's their geometries. So I saw a bunch of symbols like these. I began to do more and more research on what those symbols represent. What was behind these symbols? Some of these symbols are found in all the indigenous art, not just Hinduism, this is Hindu or Sanskrit, symbol of Sri Gatra. And, but they weren't just confined to Hinduism or Sanskrit. They were found, I found them in the Cherokee Indian folklore, Taoist, similar, similar, you could say, art, similar constructs or geometric shapes in art. So there was something in the subconscious that was recognizing the symbol, you know, the artist put it on the cave, whatever. What, what was behind the symbol? Information fields become active according to what cycle they are in. So, uh, let's look at a cycle. What do I mean by a cycle? So, we all heard uh, one of our favorite stories is that the caterpillar transforming into a butterfly, complete change of form. And so, this, year, this is a cycle, right? It's A, caterpillar, chrysalis, the butterfly, and then like, like that. Now, what's interesting about cycles like this is that, relatively speaking, the time frame for each is not equal. In other words, let's say, you know a dog year, like a well, human years, according to the dog, if the dog is three, that's like 45 dog, uh, human years. Seven. Something. Seven. Okay. Four, four, four. Yeah. So, so you translate. Right? So for, let's say this caterpillar lives for human years and translating how that works like 100 years old. It really doesn't. But the caterpillar lives 90 years, over 90 years compared to the 10 years for this, or the 9 years for this compared to the 1 year for that. Interesting. But the change from the caterpillar to the butterfly is 27. So there's a, there's a, a phase of stability that is part of nature, part of quantum uh, events. And these, these, these events uh, maintain their structure for a relatively long time. And there's a quick jump. There's a quick and sudden shift. And how cells work, and how our you know, baby's born, and then it slows down, and like that. There's another one. So the, the seed takes a long time, this is the seed. The seed has all the information that the plant needs, right? The information fields are here, but the frequencies, or codes, or information fields, 
linguistics, again, whatever you want to call them, information fields I like. They're not, they're not, they're not, they're here at this point, but they're not blueprints for the blossoming flower because it hasn't reached that cycle. So the blueprint for this stage is for the stability of the seed, to protect the seed from other things happening around in the earth. And then that, that phase changes, quick sudden jump, seed decays, goes back to earth, and then these other phases fall, like that. Uh, also interesting is that, and this is, this is not a uh, metaphor, I was hoping that people who actually botanists and biologists. So okay, we've got the seed that pumps out, and the innate intelligence of nature creates these different forms. Uh, you can say, before the rose, this is a certain consistency of, of exchange of energy. We call it photosynthesis, right? So the plant, the green plant, gives out oxygen, takes in carbon dioxide, and synthesizes that with the sunlight, and that's, that's a paradigm. It's, it's consistent exchange of energy and structure that's consistent. Now, up here, right, oh, sorry, right before there's a change, there's an increase of disorder. So here there was order, 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 and then right here there's an increase of disorder, actual disorder in the cellular structure. So if you were to double click there, you'd say, listen, we're flock right now, there's, there's, the cells are not coherent anymore. But then the leaf comes out, and go, oh, we get it. The higher, higher form of order, and so forth. And the, the highest level of potential for this plant, you'd say, is the flowering rose, preceded by the highest level of chaos. So you're looking at the green photosynthetic paradigm breaking down, literally. And a lot of the cells of that plant, they, they don't make it, right? And how does this, this thing, that doesn't look anything like that, how does it become that? Well, there's the information field that's been available all along. So at the right time, preceded by the breaking down of the pre-existing paradigm. Not a demolishing of it, but a breaking down to giving way to a higher state of order. The, the flower comes out, the, the rose. And what's interesting is that there's no longer photosynthesis up there. The paradigm is shifted. The flower doesn't take in carbon dioxide and get oxygen. You get oxygen. What does it do? It gets out fragrance and beauty. There's not a whole different kind of energy. So the bees come, you know, nature continues on because that phase is near its completion. The flower decays, but the cycle continues. Now it turns out humanity is going through, has gone through science. Humanity has gone through science, is going through science. So back to suffering and cruelty. You could say the tragedy of unexpected death or even expected death that is pulling on our hearts uh, in different ways. It turns out humanity is finishing up a phase. And it, there's only one season in this picture where there's blossoming. That's in the spring of time. So humanity has gone through looking at Sanskrit iconography and ancient mythology. This is, is anybody know who this is? Kali? Yeah, we all know. So, so this is a phase of humanity necessary, right? So Kali We've all read about her. She actually contains all the information of unconditional love and light and harmony, and uh, she certainly isn't cruel or allows any suffering. But at this phase, you know, look at she's she looks kind of pissed off, huh? 
So this is a, a, a phase of humanity that is going into a new phase of potential. The season of humanity is is right or right on the bridge. And it, this is actually recorded in the Vedas. So when I began to put all these things together, the symbols that I saw out of body, the, the, the symbols that I, in the same kind of geometry as the symbols that I found in plant life, nature, and in our own DNA, and then wondering about suffering, wondering about cruelty, pain, and then reading in the Vedas, there's a, each, each Veda, each hymn, has a Rishi Devacha Chandas. So it's like, uh, as a musician, you're looking at a piece of music, what key are you in? What's the rhythm? Sometimes they record a note, people turn to me. There's information there about the song. Same with the Vedas. These things, five, six thousand years old, and prior to that, they were sung. And I'm sure there's been some distortion, some misinterpretation along the way that I've read it. But even now, if you go back to the Vedas and look at the changes of phases, so you read about the phase changes of humanity, going from calling you the Sakya, there are hymns. Rishi, Rishi is the is the the, the tomb or the key. David taught us like the, the uh, different kind of structure of chandas. Chandas is the rhythm. No word for rhythm is frequency. Or sign oscillation. So some, somewhere humanity cognized its future, cognized the blueprint for an awakening, a paradigm shift. It's built in. And I, I love you guys because nobody here said we need to add something to ourselves and make us more whole. Uh, in, in various ways, we've all talked about just releasing the interference, releasing what's in the way. Being out of our own way sometimes. When we say that, we generally mean being out of our own mental ways, our emotional ways. And what reveals is according to the phase we're in. So it doesn't mean that immediately tomorrow there'll be no suffering or no cruelty. But the reason why we have that hope, the reason why we all intrinsically feel that we're, there, there's, there's a better quality of life potentially on this planet. The, right now, there's somebody robbing a bank, there's, you know, somebody's kicking a dog. I, I, that's as far as I'll go. Because we know there's a lot worse things, but what in my mind? Pretty bad kicking a dog. For no reason. It's good that she's sick. There is no amount of money, I know this for a fact, for all of you, there is no amount of money that any of you can get paid to harm another being. Another animal. No. Billion dollars? It's not in your consciousness. You have evolved to the point where it is impossible. Not only, and not only because you've heard that we're all one, not only because you've heard of the golden rule, not only because you've been taught, you know, to do good, it's because you've reached that state of consciousness. It's an automatic. You cannot harm another uh, being, person. Mistakes. I'm not talking about. There are people on the planet that, I mean, I say anything wrong. They haven't reached that state of consciousness. So, so the the inspirational uh, when when I when, when I realize this and then I go out by and, and get downloads of information about our future potential. Um, it is. It gave me hope, it gave us, it gives us all 
a, uh, a way to reconcile what's happening in hell. Because it won't be that way in terms of the cruelty and suffering and death. If we are, the, there's 108 modules in the Vedas that correspond to Sakya. So the time of creativity, harmony, flow of information, love, real love, well, what's that? Unconditional love, automatic love. Not something we have to be taught. How many mothers have been taught how to love their infants? You know? and, and most of us, all of us in this room, do we have to be taught, you know, don't harm them. You read that? It's, it's innate. So there's 108 marvelous symbols that have been set up there that are becoming active. So the symbol back there for the note A, you don't have the consciousness, it just is a symbol on paper, you have the consciousness. If you're Brian Wilson, it's ah, oh, you're singing A. You know? You just live, and then you don't need the symbols anymore. So the, there's a, seven chakras, 108 symbols, if you do the math, it's, it doesn't, it's not a, it doesn't divide equally. Because there's more mandalas on the left side of the shinshin tube of the, of the heart than anywhere else for Sabira, which means it's the, it's the goddess, it's the feminine activation of unconditional love. And so the phase we're going into, Sat Yuga, is we're moving out of the, the dominance of the... Now we all have masculine and feminine. Okay, I'm not talking gender necessarily. But we're moving into, a, according to the Vedas, we're moving into a, a phase that is governed by, uh, by the mother, by the goddess. And there are actual models that are found in nature, are stimulating and awakening for that regard. Alright, I said that. Alright, so I I created a device. This is the first time I've ever said this to a crowd. And you guys, uh, can, I think, uh, can take this or leave it or whatever. But uh, along the way, I created a device, a device made of crystals that uh, generate the same codes and frequencies as these 108 modules. So it's kind of like, kind of like, she's sitting here, she's an enlightened being. How many of you have been around enlightened people? Masters, right? You walk up and their field changes you. You don't have to, they don't have to do anything. It's just their field of information. And they, they're setting the bar, or they, they, they've lived, they've been incarnated, they've incarnated in this, call it, uh, in Kali Yuga, but their, but their bodies and their whole beings are emanating Sakya. And that field, Changes, it heals, it, it reconciles, it resolves things. Amazing. So, with the help of a couple of these masters, uh, we created a, a device that generates these same frequencies of an enlightened being in Sakya. And she said, just, so what do I do with this? She said, just see what happens. So with that device, we began to do different tests. And in all cases, and there's so many different tests we've done, real, real clinical studies, this is an in vitro, this is a good one, cancer. Yeah. Uh, there's an in vitro, the HeLa cells, and, and let me just show you. HeLa cells and live tissue cells. So you turn on this device, the goddess 
is who she is. The cancer cells start to die, and the, the, the live cells live. And then, yeah? How is it working? How it's working? It's, it's uh, crystal oscillators. Crystal oscillators. So you, you can hear it or just the... It's silent. So, the, so this is what we see. It was published. This guy, I didn't know. This is uh, wow. Well, but we can't use an FDA. It's all shook up. But uh, we did uh, brain waves. Uh, and I love this one. If you can imagine, I think I'm getting close to my time, but I want to just a couple more things. This was a school, so called learning disorders. Yeah. Um, you can imagine. Like a closet left school with two big hallways, I mean, two big, a uh, bunch of classrooms and a hallway down the middle. So, uh, we had devices that we put in, it was a double blind study, so the teachers only thought they were clocks in the classroom, you know, just a clock. This, this school, they, instead of just sort of reading, writing, and arithmetic, they would keep track of students. Not enough task, trouble following directions, work not completed, irritability, so forth. Emotional outbursts. And so, uh, this is with the technology, this is without. These are actual quantities of students. And we, we switched the classrooms and everything. It's a really cool test. And it turns out that with this field in their learning environment, there were, let's just say, 48 years, look at, the, look at the improvement. So these are just children that are in a higher gauge symmetrical field, that's a Bill Tiller term. They're in a higher state, the, the environment is activating their higher potential. Not because the teachers taught them anything, not because they were stricter or easier or whatever, they were just in a, in, in a in their more natural environment. And there's only one thing, <laughs> and it's bringing me to tears because I, I met these kids, you know, learning disabilities. They're just, they're not learning disabilities, they just, they were just in the wrong environments. They, they just had the interference. And so the interference was removed, like we all know. You remove the interference and you know, her more full potential came out. They didn't all become the same, you know. Some people, some students would play against to it, some of the writing, you know, they, we all have our individual gifts. There's only one that didn't change, and that was the so-called problems interacting with peers. I wondered about that. I talked to the teacher. There was um, and it turns out, you say, these were actual students that they record every day, you know, problems interacting with peers. How come that went down? <clears throat> it's because the kids who were generally passive and allowed bullying stood up and said, hey, Don't you touch me that way. And the teachers then said, so, well, that's trouble interacting. So sometimes it's, we're in, we're in call of duty, some often it's necessary for boundaries to be delineated. For those who said, I have a daughter, you know, another year old, teacher knows. We, um, I'm wrapping up here. We did research on cell phones. And even though cell phones have all kinds of harmful things, I'm not saying anything new to you, new to you guys, but with the technology, the brain waves looked like it was even more relaxed and more um, calm with the cell phone than the baseline. This was done by Ronnie Croft, really conventional, wonderful scientist. Okay, so that, that led to that led to this idea of, oh my gosh, you know, cell phones are now everywhere. About four or five years ago, actually maybe ten, when I, when I saw that cell phones 
we're actually an answer to our call to be all connected. And this was a way of an answer, but it came with the consequences of EMF and the, all kinds of issues. So it's, in a sense, back to the original model. Everything can be a carrier weight for other forms of information, right? So we went into research and we found that we could actually generate a field of information to be broadcast from a URL in California to one cell phone in Australia. And we did this over many, many months to make sure it really worked. Now, first cell phone, okay, I'm receiving the signal. These are the 108 modules, our future potential, or our or more, or more, or more whole reality potential. So the cell phone was a subjective flag. I don't have any to do much testing. So then we, we, so we got to really prove this, because this is, this is really important stuff. So we did a two-year study, Melanie Rubin. She measured the heart rate variability. This was, a, you might see here, this may be the first random control Trial. Trial, thank you. To show that specific frequencies of purported non hertzian the goddess, she could be called anything. She, in this case, she would be called purported non hertzian It's <laughs> type of subway energy. <laughs> Got it. Another name. Conveyed by software application broadcast by personal electronic devices, la la la. Uh, and bioactivity and beneficially impact automatic nervous system balance. So this was, again, a two-year study, really tight controls, because Beverly knew achieving under the radar for this. And it turns out that heart rate variability improved by 30% with a cell phone. And this was back to there's a URL with a 108 goddess crystal love <laughs> carrying through whatever the satellites, you know, and they go to one cell phone. So it's a it's a it's an app now that you can buy on Apple and Google. You can buy your cell phone. And I was hoping to be able to give you all one. Not quite ready yet. So here's the website. You're going to go to this lovesofthepower.com. And uh, I'm hoping to get everybody's email and stuff. This is an option. It, uh, it, it's going to be a dollar ninety-five <laughs> one-time fee. But for you guys, zero. <laughs> There's the website. It's not available quite yet. It's literally weeks away. This is what it's going to look like on your phone. You're going to, you know, slide an app. You play a game or, you know, it's going to be an app only just for your dollar ninety-five free free you go. Turn it on and you'll feel this. So it's a way, and I, uh, I don't actually have it on my cell phone, but I feel like it's the home I got. These things actually feel good. I don't want to make any more claims, but I can do. I, I, I do point to this published. By the way, this was published in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine, uh, peer reviewed. They really, uh, yeah, you know, get back. Yeah, but but I'm telling you, these guys behind this journal, I, I I love them because they were so damn tough. You know, they, they had us repeat this whole thing. She said, we're going to put this in a journal. You know, you know I, I didn't tell them about the gods. <laughs> I said, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing non-person. So this is probably just this year, it's in January. So it's kind of hot off the press. And then the whole thing about getting in the proof with Apple, the App Store, and all that stuff is another yeah, so we got through that. So there's the website. And the, this is just something I want to throw out there. 
uh, Dean Ray, the chief scientist at IONS. He's a good friend of mine. I used to work at IONS. I used to play with him at the lab. Uh, there's a theory that just one percent, well, oh, this is not a theory, this is the facts, this one. One percent of photons, somebody said it the other day, are, are in coherence. It affects all the 99 percent. The entire stream of photons jump up to create a laser 100,000 more times powerful. No additional photons. It's just a law of coherence. So, talking to Dean and others, what would happen if 1% of the global population were functioning with more activated heart chakras? How can you get to 1%? It's about 70 million people. They're freaking cell phones. <laughs> or another way. We're also working on water and music. You know, and so the big, the trade secret here is that this technology that I shared with you, and there's a lot more, is inspired by myself. This, I can't take any, because to go through the death portal, I have to, I can't have any desire. I can't have any agenda. I can't have any personality, at least for me. I, if I have anything like that, like I want to be good, I don't want, then I can't go through. The, that, that's that's a thought. That's some kind of some. It's 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 a it's a something disruptive. Even though it's like I don't know, love my God, whatever it is. If I have any of that. I can't go through. <clears throat> I have to be willing to at that moment, and I've done it enough times to to die forever. And never come back forever. And that is the porthole. This is something that maybe you might find interesting. The porthole is to identify what I am most resisting inside myself. That's my little meditation. So I say my prayers with compassion like that. What am I most resisting? Well, you know, I might not get this on that. You know, I'm not enlightened, so I have things that I resist, things that I'm attached to. I go there. And then you allow those resistances or those fears to just kill you. Just allow them to do whatever they want because guess what? We really are invincible. We really are more than death. So I find the place that I'm most resistant. And another word for accepting that, for surrendering into that place. Love, devotion, surrender. Love, I accept it exactly the way it is, without any, you know, any desire to change it. Unconditional love. Devotion is just an act of, in a sense, your shock is changed. And then surrender, which is what they will be done. And then there's the, I sink past all the all the elephants of my karmas, all the elephants of my fears, and my you know this and that. It's like the old this. They I don't I still have fear. I still have wounds from my past. But it's like the old thing. I sink through. I it's not a guy. <clears throat> and these things happen. These impressions are made upon. Uh, uh, a, a, a field that, that my consciousness can remember or can identify. And then I go to service. And, and my practice is that. It's, it's to serve in every moment. I, I am not enlightened. I'm not. I'm, I'm just I'm a scared little boy. And that has had this amazing experience that it's taught me to to, from moment to moment, remember, he said it, moment by moment, remember. Like, see, a simple, oh, you know, that's the key, I should be saying. Oh, there, there's the, look at nature, because you were saying this. And then, the heart feels safer, and the heart can then really serve. So that's just me. 
Um, but it's also, since I'm part of nature, and we all are part of nature, we, we, can, we can look in awe at the intelligence behind nature and know that we are in a blossoming. The reason why our blessed Dr. Laszlo is talking about a new paradigm, and we all are listening and activated by that concept and participating in that reality, is that we know it to be true. And the gardener doesn't have to see the actual blossoming. He knows that we're just coming out of winter, you know. But it's a little bit more tricky for us because we have not in recent time ever blossomed as humanity without cruelty and suffering and, and unorganized death and destruction. It's in the blueprint. And as we exercise our free will, which is the matter of where our attention is placed, we can participate in this blossoming and enjoy as this dark night ends with the new dawn and the sun comes up. Thank you.